it's a joke. I am working for the foreign policy council on Ukrainian tourism. And my task for today is to talk about future with you. Why future? Because future was always uh, an object of interest of different people through the history. Once upon a time, in order to know the future, people addressed witches and wizards. They were playing with crystal balls in order to know what to expect from tomorrow. The years were passing, but the interest in the future was never gone. People, humankind, was always interested in knowing what to expect from tomorrow, from the next year, what to expect and how to get prepared for the future. Basically, the times have changed. There are no more effective and efficient witches and wizards in the playground. But anyway, the interest in the future isn't gone. And people still try to make forecasts to define different scenarios of the future and to prepare to get prepare, prepared for the future. These efforts are combined with the scientific progress. And therefore, now there are many scientific methods of forecasting or foresighting or building scenarios or analyzing the trends. As a matter of the fact, uh, uh, we are anyway interested uh, in the future and we are anyway applying these methods implicitly, even without knowing that we are building scenarios, but we do. Let's just think about uh, very simple examples. When you go to the airport, you try to choose the best route and you are trying to analyze the trends, the level of traffic on the roads, the weather outside, because it also has its impact on traffic, the money you possess to pay for the taxi driver or for the train ticket to the airport, the time when your flight is scheduled and the risks that it will be delayed or canceled. Therefore, you are building scenarios. If you go by car, then there is a high probability that you will get into the traffic jam and you're going to be late for your flight. But if the weather is bad, your flight can be delayed. So it is worth trying to go by car. If you go by train, then the chances to get in time are higher. However, the comfort of your trip will be lower. That's a very simple example, but there are more complicated situations and uh, more analysis needed. I mean, in my example, if you choose the wrong uh, option and if you go a uh, wrong way, then you will probably lose your ticket for the flight and miss your flight and will have to pay for another ticket. But if the stakes are higher, then definitely the efforts and uh, the costs invested into the scenario building should be higher. That's what big corporations and state government usually do. They are doing foresight to know what to expect from the future and the stakes are really high. Therefore, the efforts are higher the efforts uh, undertaken are very multifaceted and uh, therefore the scenarios uh, are more interesting and they give you more vision of the future. However, if you try to deal with the future, if you try to deal with building scenarios, you should keep in mind three important things. First, by building scenarios, by no means you determine the future. It's not future determination. It's just a theoretical uh, exercise. Theoretical exercise that helps you to build your strategy and to get a more clear vision. Second important thing, thing to remember is that uh, by building scenarios, you do not project the past into the future. The future is unknown, 
we have to admit it. And we have to admit that the future never repeats the past. And the third thing to remember is that by building scenarios, you are not making a true full-scale forecast. You rather play with the theory. You have a theoretical intellectual game. However, this game provides you with a number of scenarios, variety of scenarios, which you can consider while building your strategy for the future. And uh, by considering these scenarios, you, to some extent, prevent negative consequences. By, to some extent, you prevent uh, um, negative impact on your business or negative impact on your policy. That's why building scenarios uh, is very interesting, but it's just a first step in uh, building uh, your strategy which will guide you through the challenges of the future. Now I will try to explain you step by step how to build the scenarios, because it's a very complicated but extremely interesting process. So step number one, it's your team. When you are thinking about uh, building scenarios, you should engage as many experts from different fields as possible. That's something that we tried to do uh, when uh, we were building scenarios for the Eastern Partnership with our partners from the Think Visegrad uh, Network, uh, Visegrad Insight, and from uh, German Marshall Fund. We gathered the experts from all Eastern Partnership countries, but also experts from Visegrad four countries and from Germany. These experts were from different fields of expertise, Green Deal, international relations, demographic situation in the countries, economics, and so on and so forth. The more factors, the more trends you want to consider, the more experts from different fields of expertise you have to engage. That can be a challenge, that's true. But it depends on the ambition you have, on the task you are facing, and on the client you are dealing with. If for the client the costs in case of emergency will be high, then they will definitely support your efforts to engage as many experts as possible and to study, to research, to explore as many factors as possible. When you gather these people all together, you have to think about the further steps. So step number two is basically picking the right factors to consider and picking the right trends to take into account when building your scenarios. Technically speaking, if you wanna collect these factors, if you want to assess their probability, their impact, and uh, their interconnection. You have to talk to people you've assembled, and there are different ways how to do that. If you are limited in time and limited in budget, then usual brainstorming works. You just have to put people at the same table and let them talk about their vision of the future, their vision of the trends, the vision of different figures, different uh, assessments, different uh, uh, probability of development of the situation. If you have some more time and more resources, then you can switch into the World Cafe method. It's uh, briefly speaking, the method of group discussion when different experts from different fields are gathering at different tables and this group discussion is moderated by those who are basically supposed to build the scenarios after the exercise is over. If you have even more time and even more resources, then apart from World Cafe, which is on spot, you can also think about uh, gathering information by, by the expert survey 
or otherwise by having separate focus groups on different issues that are related to the issue you want to explore about the future you want to define. What happens then? During this uh, discussion, it's very necessary to find out what are the factors you have to focus at. What are the factors you have to consider first and foremost? And here, there are two things that really matter. First, that's the impact of the factor on the system you are analyzing. So let's say if it is an international system, you should think of the factors that have highest impact on it be it international conflicts, be it uh, international economic situation, or be it whatever else your experts suggest to consider. Second, and it is no less important, it's the, not the impact, but cross impact. That's why this method of analysis sometimes is called uh, uh, trend impact and cross impact analysis. You have to think not only about the full of impact factors, but also of factors which are interconnected. Usually I give a very simple example. Uh, what's the impact of the big uh, vessel in the Pacific Ocean? It has impact on the economics because it brings the goods from one country to another. It has impact on uh, the economic situation in these countries. It has impact on prices. It has impact on uh, jobs that people have because of this vessel bringing goods from one country to another. It has impact on the relations of these countries as well. But let's take this ship, this vessel, from the state ocean, from, 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 from the global ocean. Let's take it from uh, global ocean and put it into Suez Strait. Then there are two factors interconnected. And now the role of this ship becomes really crucial because if it is stuck in the Suez Strait, then the impact is getting multiplied because of the fact that now it's the impact not only on the factors or on the all the issues that i've mentioned before but it's also the impact on uh, other vessels other companies engaged relations between other countries uh, relations between other people so the impact is growing because of this cross effect so your task during the discussion is to pick the most impactful uh, factors, but also the factors that uh, are interconnected. Later on, when you think about uh, building the strategy, you also have to think of uh, uh, the way either to reconnect different factors or I, I, or alternatively, how to break the links, the connections between different factors, if you do not want the cross impact to take place. Let's move further. So you take the most impactful factors, you pick uh, the most cross connected, interconnected factors, and you think how to build the scenarios. Here, it's a very creative task to build the scenarios. And uh, usually you are, you are tempted to get into a few methodological, into a few methodological traps. First, very often your client, whoever it is, either a state government or a big corporation asks you to build positive, negative, and neutral scenarios. 
of course it's it seems reasonable because you have to get prepared for for the negative scenario you have to think of the good sides of, of the positive scenario you can keep uh, relaxed if uh, the scenario uh, forecasted uh, as a neutral one but that's a definite methodological trap because just psychologically when you want to build a positive scenario you are tempted to take all the positive factors into one basket then if you are building a negative scenario you just put all the negative factors into another basket but it doesn't work in reality there are no ideal things in the reality and same is true with the scenario building if you are trying to build just positive scenario you can skip intentionally or unintentionally just because of your psychological type of thinking you may skip some factors that will have an impact on scenario but will be excluded from your analysis let's take uh, the situation with covid 19 as one of the examples ideally if we think about one scenario a positive one if we mark it as a positive one if we label it as a positive one then it's getting clear that in such a positive scenario the virus will be defeated the humankind each and every person will be vaccinated the negative impact of the economic uh, crisis will be overcome and therefore therefore everything looks very rosy but as a matter of fact the situation is a bit different the point is that even if everyone is vaccinated then we should think about the level of uh, economic growth I mean the impact of the economic crisis on different countries and probably those who benefited from producing right vaccines will benefit while those who will have to buy them will be deprived in their in their rights and possibilities and that will have a negative aspect and if you are thinking only about the positive scenario you will just skip this negative aspect and therefore your scenario won't be full and your scenario will be uh, will be uh, not the best one not the ideal one if you think about the negative scenario only then here you face a challenge again because let's take the same example let's think that we didn't we haven't overcome COVID-19 pandemic what happens then definitely the economic situation remains bad definitely the humankind faces health problems and uh, now it doesn't look rosy at all it looks like a very black scenario but let's think about the positive aspects of it indeed there are economic troubles however people who learned how to work at home the people who learned how to use messengers uh, communication platforms zoom for communication they get more time they get more time for their families they get more time for their hobbies they are getting more creative and that's a positive side of it and this creative thinking may bring us to a very bright result in the future but we will just uh, skip thinking about these positive things if we build just a negative scenario therefore if your client wants you to build a positive or a negative scenario you should always say that it's impossible methodologically but there is always a but if you want to satisfy your client with some compromise decision 
you should probably think about another gradation of scenarios. Uh, the point is that each system you are analyzing has some common rules of behavior. That behavior is uh, impacted uh, by the level of fluctuation the system faces. If the fluctuation is not too high, then the system will remain stable. There will be no significant changes. And if your client is interested in such a situation, then it's going to be a positive scenario for him or her. But the point is that you do not call it positive scenario. You call it the scenario when the situation will remain stable and the system will remain stable. There is another reaction of system on fluctuation. If the fluctuation gets some gets some uh, influence, which is more than a very basic one, then the system will be disbalanced. But this disbalance will be within certain margins. What I mean is that the system will be dynamic, not a stable one, but you can easily forecast that these dynamics will not exceed certain margins. And such scenario, to some extent, can be called a neutral one when there are some unexpected things, but these unexpected things are anyway within certain margins. And then the third one, which we may call negative if we are interested in stability, is when the fluctuation gets such a strength that the system is getting disbalanced totally. That bring us, brings us beyond the margins of the relatively stable system. And uh, then we face absolutely unpredictable situation. Usually most of the clients who you deal with, be it the governments or the corporations or the private companies, they are least interested in such a development. And for them, such a scenario can be a negative one. Just if we take uh, the international system and think of it, uh, we can say that, for example, the United States as a country which is dominated the international uh, relations is interested in status quo, because for them, preserving this dominance would be a positive scenario. If we take, uh, let's say, China or India, on the one hand, they benefit from the world order, from being part of the international economic system, from being part the, of the United Nations organization and having influence there. On the other hand, in case of Beijing, they are not interested in the American domination. So in such a case, in such a case, what you have to do is to think about their interests. And yes, they are interested in the system which will be fluctuating, but fluctuating within the certain margins. If you take a look at Russia, Moscow definitely lost the Cold War. Moscow is also not that much progressing in its war against Ukraine because of the rules-based order, because of the sanctions, because of the pressure of the West. And Moscow definitely doesn't want such system to exist. For them, the negative scenario is the best one, although it is the worst one for all the rest. So you basically avoid call, calling scenarios positive or negative, but uh, judging from the interest of your client or judging from the interest of those who you work with, you can uh, label uh, your scenarios as uh, stable, relatively stable and unstable. 
and uh, let your client pick the scenario which is best for him or her. Let's move forward. Now, when we discussed uh, the way we build the scenarios, uh, there are a few more things to keep in mind uh, before you finalize it, before you write your scenario, put it on a paper and sell it to your client or to your partner. That's naming. As uh, I've already mentioned, uh, it makes no sense to call scenarios uh, good or bad, but it makes sense to name them. That's something that we did with uh, our scenarios for the Eastern Partnership we built with colleagues from Michigan Right Insight and German Marshall Fund a few years ago. We call them civic emancipation. We call them getting back uh, to Soviet Union reloaded. We call them silent uh, integration into the EU. You can pick even more juicy names because your client has to get clear what to expect from the scenario just by name. The name is the key to the successful scenario building. If the name is right, then it's highly probable that your client will be satisfied with you. For the name, you may choose uh, different allusions. For the name, you can uh, collect the features of the scenario and uh, uh, describe it in one sentence, and it's gonna work. And it's very important to, to name the scenarios. So getting back to the process of the scenario building, uh, let me summarize it briefly. First, you get the team, the team of the experts from different fields related to the issue you are trying to research, you are trying to explore. Then, depending on your resources, with this team, together with these people, together with these experts, what you have to do is to find out which factors have the highest impact and how the factors are interconnected. Afterwards, grounding on what you found, grounding on the factors that are most impactful and most interconnected, you are building your scenarios. If the client wants some gradation of scenarios, you suggest him or her scenarios when the system will remain stable, when the system will remain relatively stable, and when the system will remain unstable. <coughs> After that, you name these scenarios. You name these scenarios in a creative way to make people remember what you mean by each of the scenarios. And then there is another methodological trap you can get into and you should keep it in mind that by building scenarios you do not forecast the future it's absolutely impossible to forecast the future and to give you 100 percent forecast that will help to build your strategy what you do is providing variety of the possibilities and your client has to keep in mind the whole variety in order to build the strategy in the way in the way that will help to tackle the problems emerging from each of them that's the only way to make this uh, scenario building method operational and that's the only way to use it in the strategy building and shaping the strategies that will help you to prevent the negative consequences of uh, the implementation of this or that scenario. When you are done with the naming, you basically, you are basically a success. So you now have at least some knowledge on how to build the scenarios, on how to interconnect trend impact 
and cross impact impact analysis how to how to name your scenarios and how to explain to the client what scenario building means that's the way it works in academia that's the way it works in think tanks and that's the way it works in practice and i do hope that my remarks were helpful for you and you're going to be interested in this scientific method and you're going to make right successful and helpful for your client or even for yourself scenarios and foresights and thank you very much for your attention and i hope that you you find these remarks useful thank you and bye